We, the Center for Global Development, we're a group that try and see how we can make the international system that supports global development work more effectively. How do we finance infrastructure in the poorest parts of the world? How do we increase productivity in agriculture? What kind of policy brings out the best outcomes? What CGD is about is you can ask those difficult questions that people refuse to ask and actually find solutions. We're thinking about how climate change will impact migration patterns, how that will in turn have impacts on people's health. It's challenging to be able to align budget with ambitious programmatic goals, but it can be done. If you can help to make things a little bit better, that's a good way to spend your time. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Welcome to the Center for Global Development and to this presentation, which looks out at the global economy in 2024 and asks the question, is it turning a corner? Uh, some of you will be familiar with the fact that uh, beginning of each year in January for the last few years, we've been uh, doing a, an event where we have a presentation of the economic outlook for the year, focusing on developing countries and a discussion of that outlook uh, by a panel. And the presentation has been done every year by Ehan Kos, uh, who is the uh, director of the Global Prospects Group at the World Bank and the deputy chief economist of the World Bank Group. And it is Ehan's uh, team. Ehan and his team have uh, produced in January every year the Global Economic Prospects Report, which sets out uh, their view, their take of uh, where the world economy is and, and uh, the challenges and opportunities facing developing countries for the year ahead. So the way we're going to run this uh, hour is to start off uh, by asking Ehan to walk us through that uh, uh, the, the work that they have done to, to give us a presentation. Then we have a, uh, uh, a panel that is going to discuss that. And uh, uh, there are at least two and hopefully three people who will be on this panel. The, the, the panel members that are going to join us after Ehan's presentation are uh, Charles Collins, who is a, a colleague of many, many years. We used to work together at uh, one point in the IMF, but Charles has uh, had a career most recently as a director of the independent evaluation office of the IMF, uh, from which he retired recently, and, and he's now a senior advisor at, uh, at Econofact. Uh, Charles has also worked at the uh, U.S. Treasury at one point. And then the other uh, colleague uh, who will be joining us, I hope, is Hanan Morsi. Uh, she's still not online, but uh, Hanan is the Deputy Executive Secretary of the Economic Commission for Africa and the Chief Economist there. Uh, and finally, uh, Liliana Rojas Suarez, who is a senior fellow here at CGD and who has been uh, the organizing spirit behind these annual presentations. So we look forward to their comments and perspectives. But before that, Ehad, welcome to you. Always a pleasure to have you at CGD and looking forward to your presentation on the world economy for this year. Uh, thank you, Mesut, and uh, thank you again for uh, the invitation. It's wonderful to uh, have this tradition with the Center for Global Development, the, uh, the premier uh, think tank when it comes to development issues in the world, uh, thanks to your leadership. Uh, now, what I would like to do very quickly, go over uh, some main messages from the latest edition of Global Economic Prospects, which we released last week. Um, so let me share my screen. I hope everyone can see the screen now. Yes, uh, excellent. So the 
This edition of Global Economic Prospects has the usual chapters, the, the global outlook and the regional outlooks. The bank uh, follows six uh, regions and uh, we have an outlook for each region in chapter two. In addition, we have two analytical chapters. One looks at uh, investment booms and uh, the, the benefits associated with these investment booms. And the other one looks at the fiscal policy in commodity exporters zooms in the kind of the procyclicality and volatility of fiscal policy. I'm not going to get into these analytical chapters today. Um, I uh, urge uh, uh, audience members to look at these chapters. Uh, I'm going to focus on mainly the global outlook, uh, given the interest we have. So three quick questions uh, for the sake of the discussion today. The first one, what are the near term prospects for the global economy? The second one, what are the major risks really confronting the global economy? And third one, what are the policy priorities? Uh, I'm going to use this acronym EMDEs that stand for Emerging Market and Developing Economies. So let's start with the first question. What are the near term prospects for the global economy? Uh, this figure uh, is, I think, quite telling. Um, at the beginning of the last year, there was quite a bit of you know, pessimism about the ability of the global economy to stand the types of shocks uh, uh, the, the, the basically hitting the many corners of the world. Um, the good news is that despite all of these shocks, the, you know, the war in uh, Europe, the Russian invasion of Ukraine, uh, the problems we see, the conflict in the Middle East, geopolitical tensions among major economies, um, the very high inflation rates we have seen, the, uh, the reaction of central banks with uh, uh, sharp interest rate increases, the global economy has shown remarkable resilience. Growth uh, slowed down. Uh, relative to 2022, in 2023, um, around now last year, growth estimated 2.6%. So I think this is good news. We did not have a major financial crisis. We did not have a recession in a large economy. Um, the not so good news is that, as you see in this figure, uh, we still have a slowdown in our hands, and that slowdown third year in a row will continue. We are expecting global growth to decline to 2.4% this year. Um, there are good reasons for this slowdown. Of course, the uh, elevated interest rates are taking a toll, uh, especially in advanced economies. Having said that, um, the resilience last year was driven uh, largely because of the strength of the US economy. US economy delivered growth around 2.5%, much higher than its growth potential. Uh, but this year, advanced economies as a group will slow, uh, as you see in this figure. In the context of emerging market developing economies, uh, China um, is going to continue slowing down this year. Uh, but some large economies last year, like India, uh, Indonesia, Mexico, Brazil, delivered robust growth rates and uh, growth uh, actually for the EMD group, the emerging developed economies picked up. The, this year we are expecting growth to uh, a tad below uh, lower than last year. But if you take out China from the emerging developing economy group, you will see that uh, growth actually is going to uh, increase a little bit. Now I'm going to get into the details. And the first important detail is that uh, when you look at uh, the overall performance around the world, there is clear divergence. That divergence uh, manifests itself how you know the kind of the major economies have been doing, especially advanced economies. And as you see on the left, we will see these major engines of growth slowing this year. Uh, especially the US and China. China this year, we are expecting to register growth less than 5%, which is going to be the lowest growth rate uh, since 1990, ahead of the uh, outside of the pandemic period. 
Euro area, we are expecting to deliver a bit higher growth, but you know, uh, still lower than the what we saw on average prior to the pandemic. So the first important observation, the major engines of the global economy, advanced economies and China, gonna slow down. That's an issue for developing economies. If you look at emerging developing economies and basically separate them into two groups, the group, uh, they have strong credit ratings and that weak credit ratings, there is a clear difference between the two. Those countries with strong credit ratings, despite high interest rates, were able to deliver meaningful growth. But those with weaker credit ratings have been struggling. And I will talk a little bit more about this issue later in the presentation. Another big challenge for developing economies, the state of global trade. As you see in the middle panel, global trade growth last year was basically zero. This year, we are expecting growth to pick up, actually exceed 2%, but this is going to be half of what we saw prior to the decade, the average the, the, before the pandemic. Now, the third important issue for emerging developing economies, of course, the, the, the financing conditions. And here on the right, you see the US real interest rates, not just due to nominal rates. Uh, we are expecting US Fed to start cutting interest rate, especially in the second half of the year, if data confirms a sustained decline in inflation and activity slows down in the way we are expecting. Having said that, the real interest rate is at the highest level since early uh, 1980s, the Volcker uh, basically tightening cycle. And the speed of the increase in interest rates, the real interest rates, was quite remarkable, as you see on the right. I'm going to get back to this theme. So the financing conditions, even in an environment, nominal interest rates coming down, if, of course, inflation comes down as well, the, can imply elevated real rates, and that could be a challenge. Now, let's put these numbers in historical context and try to think about what they mean. Because so far, I said there are some good news. There is resilience, even though the global economy is slowing, the, even though you know the, the we see these you know multiple shocks around the world. The first observation is that if you think about the first half of this decade, 2020-24, and look at global growth average, that average is going to be the weakest since early 1990s. In fact, 1995. So uh, this is an important decade because by the end of this decade, the global community would like to get close to the sustainable development goals, but we are far away to basically make significant progress given the type of growth performance we have around the world. The middle chart tells you something else about the, you know, the how much GDP per capita has been changing in emerging developing economies relative to advanced economies. Ultimately, we want these economies to make progress in terms of increasing their income levels. But as you see, uh, China and India, they have made significant progress. But when you take them out of the sample, emerging market developing economies basically literally stagnating. And uh, fragile uh, conflict states basically regressing um, back. Another uh, way to look at the progress uh, is the, you know, the, what happened to the GDP per capita uh, since the pandemic. And there as well, you see close to 30% emerging market developing economies. By the end of 2024, will have per capita income still lower than what they had in 2019. In the case of low income countries, that number is 40%. Fragile conflict states, 60%. So not enough progress when this growth numbers put in perspective, even though there is resilience. Let me turn to the second question. What are the major risks confronting the global economy? There, the big news is that the order of risks in the risk matrix has changed. Conflict and geopolitical tensions become the number one risk we need to focus on given the kind of the challenges we see in two major regions when it comes to uh, you know, 
producing uh, energy when it comes to producing food for the global economy, namely Eastern Europe and the Middle East. If conflict escalates in, of course, these regions, we can ex expect an increase in energy prices, energy market disruptions, and that could have uh, additional uh, inflation shocks, uh, at least in terms of the headline inflation. That will turn into persistently higher interest rates, and of course, uh, it could lead to elevated uh, financing uh, uh, the conditions, the tighter financing conditions, which might push some developing economies into financial stress. We are worried about weaker than expected near-term growth in major economies, especially China, given the, the problems in the property sector and the increasing you know, importance of uh, these uh, the, the structural challenges the Chinese economy is facing. Trade fragmentation is a major threat. Climate-related disasters, the frequency and cost of disasters will be increasing. And we are worried about weaker than expected long-term growth. To briefly talk about these risks, I'm not going to discuss geopolitical tensions. I'm hoping that we will have this discussion at the panel. But uh, we are expecting, in the context of inflation, inflation to come down this year steadily. And by the end of this year, actually get close to the kind of the the three percent average but this is going to be still above the 2015-19 average at the global level and there is uh, quite a bit of uncertainty around the forecast if uh, we see a problem uh, in terms of escalation of the conflict that could have implications for energy prices and that could have implications of course the headline inflation through second round affects the core inflation as well in the case of emerging market developing economies, uh, the you know the the difference between the bond yields and economic growth has been widening. So there was this idea that you know as long as you are able to deliver growth higher than you know the fine the the cost of borrowing, uh, things can go well. You can borrow, but that arithmetic has changed. So real interest rates no longer negative. And in an environment with positive real interest rates with weak growth, financing conditions have become very tight. And as you see, for uh, countries on the right, uh, bond issues for these, you know, the weak uh, credit countries with weak credit ratings basically ceased. You don't see countries with uh, C below C credit ratings able to issue bonds anymore. So that uh, is an important development when we think about the, you know, the financing needs in emerging developing economies. I did not talk about the near-term growth prospects in regions. Uh, I, what I would like to talk about the per capita growth in regions relative to advanced economies over the period 2021-25 versus 2010-19. And let's remember 2019 10, 19 was not a good decade for many emerging market developing economies. So uh, East Asia and Pacific and South Asia will deliver high uh, per capita growth relative to advanced economies. But still, the, over the, you know, the 21, 25 period, but still on average, less than what they did in the previous decade. In Europe, uh, Central Asia, and um, in, in Latin America and Caribbean, Middle East, North Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa, the per capita income growth would basically be low. Uh, in the case of Sub-Saharan Africa, negative. In the case of Middle East, North Africa, close to zero. In the case of Latin America, less than one. In the case of Europe, Central Asia, around one. So this type of per capita growth will not deliver the type of transformation we are expecting in these economies. This year, we have this, you know, IDA fundraising campaign, the members of International Development Association. It is critical for us to have a strong campaign. And this figure clearly shows the big challenge there. In the case of IDA, per capita growth is zero, almost negative, relative to what they delivered, you know, in the previous decade that wasn't enough either, but it, at least it was positive. So in terms of income catch up, the state of many developing economies is not 
good. Now, let me turn to uh, risk scenarios and this, what these risk scenarios mean for the global economy. The first risk I mentioned is escalation of conflict in the Middle East. And we are thinking about if that conflict escalates, uh, oil prices could go up. And this year, our uh, price forecast for oil for the entire year is around $80. That might translate into a 30% increase, the conflict escalation, in light of what happened before. If that happens, we expect you know this 2.4% growth this year to come down to 2.2%. Financial stress in emerging market developing economies or a slower China growth. If China grows less than 4% rather than close to 5%, then again, uh, global growth would go down by about 0.2 percentage points. There's one upside risk I need to mention is that there's the resilience of the U.S. economy. U.S. economy has delivered something quite remarkable. Inflation has come down without much of an effect on labor markets. In fact, labor markets remain uh, significantly vibrant in the U.S. economy. As I mentioned, the, you know, higher than potential growth delivered last year. U.S. can repeat that performance. If that happens, of course, we will see higher growth around the world and with these you know, very large spillovers associated with the U U.S. economy. Finally, what are the policy priorities? I'm going to go very quick here. The big challenge uh, in the context of emerging market developing economies, the need to have an investment boom. This is critical when we think about, you know, the climate, uh, of course, um, and the climate related needs. And you see it on the left, how large these needs are, especially for, you know, low income countries, lower middle income countries around uh, close to 9% per year for uh, the foreseeable future for the lower middle income countries around 5%. Now, there are those needs, but when you look at investment growth, uh, the story is not pleasant in the sense that, as you see on the right, investment growth is slowing and much lower than what it is used, used to be in the 2000s when you look at this 2010-25 period. So uh, it's going to be critical to undertake a comprehensive reform package that uh, basically improves fiscal frameworks, fiscal positions, improves monetary and financial policy frameworks, improves institutions and basically translates into an investment boom. We looked at uh, close to 200 investment booms. We looked at uh, more than 12 uh, country cases uh, in detail in the latest issue of the global economic prospects. And what is critical is to have this you know, comprehensive policy package to trigger these booms. At the global level, the big challenge is to work together. It's not going to be possible to solve the problems of climate, food insecurity, debt, and, and many other common challenges the global economy is facing, including challenges related to geopolitics. So the, 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 the ownership of the rules-based multilateral system, belief in that system, and finding solutions and finding, you know, the 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 uh, common points going to be critical in the new year uh, uh, as we think about these problems. Uh, I invite uh, all of you to look at our publications um, available at the World Bank webpage. But let me stop here. Back to you, uh, uh, Mesut. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ahan. Uh, that was a super presentation. It gave us a very nice overview of uh, the prospects and also the risks and and some of the material that you've shared just demonstrates what a difficult few years the world economy and particularly uh, emerging markets and developing countries have been going through and and also that many of them are still not even back yet to the level of per capita incomes that they had uh, in 2019. So far from making progress from the base of 2019, we still haven't even recovered the losses that happened uh, 
partly because of COVID, uh, partly because of the consequences of the Russia's invasion of, of Ukraine, its impact on food and energy prices. Uh, so clearly we're not in a very good place. And at this point, uh, I want to bring in our our panelists, and, and I believe there will in fact be two panelists that we're going to have because Hanan Morsi, unfortunately, is uh, uh, not able to join. Uh, but I want to start with Charles. Charles, you, you react to anything that, that uh, Ehan has said, but specifically, I think it'd be great to get a bit your take on where the rest of the world is and is going to be. And I'm thinking in particular to so the US economy in Europe, which is a big driver still of global growth uh, and Japan, but also of China. And I was struck by the fact that in many of the charts that I had you posted, uh, really the big, big drop has been in, in the China compared to its historical numbers. And there is an immediate set of questions around real estate markets in China and what that means. But there's also a lot of discussion of whether, in fact, we're moving into a phase where the Chinese economy will continue to be growing at a lower rate than its historical averages. It's more than able to 5, 5, 6 percent rather than 8, 9, 10. And obviously what happens in the Chinese economy has a big impact on growth numbers and demand for exports from uh, uh, developing countries. And there's also another channel, which is perhaps a different one that doesn't directly manifest itself in growth, which is the financial flows from China to the rest of the world, which may also be impacted by slower growth. So uh, US, Europe, but also China. Charles, what, what was your take on, on where we are? And if you're a developing country, finance minister, how should you be thinking about the medium term for for the rest of the world in which you want to thrive? Uh, thanks, Masood. It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for the invitation. Uh, a tremendous uh, presentation by, by IHAN, and, and that reflects a, a really good report, uh, the most recent JEP. And I, I, I broadly agree uh, with its analysis. Um, I think the, sh the short term uh outlook is relatively encouraging uh it does look as if the u.s economy is, has bounded back uh, much more strongly than than anticipated i think it, in part reflecting the, the the very strong support uh both fiscal and monetary policy uh during the the covid period and then the an unwinding that has been handled quite deftly uh and maintained uh, private sector uh, investment spirit. So that you know, at this point, the U.S. economy has actually returned to its pre-COVID trajectory, uh, which is quite remarkable and very different from the global financial crisis. Uh, Europe is struggling more. Uh, it has more of a structural uh, issue: the big energy supply shock uh, from the Russian invasion of Ukraine and 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 uh, curtailment of, of of energy supplies. Uh, so the, the I think Europe is 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 you know is flirting with recession this year. Uh, it's going to be a tough job for the ECB to to both um, maintain uh, inflation on a downward trend, but also to avoid the, the economy sinking too far down. Um, but overall, I, I think the advanced economies are, are doing reasonably well. And, I, and I mean, my major concerns would be more the EMDEs. And when, when you ask whether the global economy has turned the corner, I think it's, it's quite striking uh, the, the lack of progress that has been made over the past five years, as Ian pointed out. But also, I think the likelihood that progress will remain very slow uh, over the next few years, going, you know, going beyond 2024, 2025, uh, through the foreseeable uh, medium-term future, because the factors that I had mentioned as, as, as dampening growth in 2024, 25 will remain relevant uh, in, in, in the period beyond that. The headwinds to, to globalization, uh, the much higher uh, real interest rates, which I, I think will be persistent, uh, even as monetary policy in the advanced economies is eased. And this is, has a particularly negative impact, I think, on the emerging economies, um, and particularly those with, with vulnerable debt situations, as, as the JEP pointed out, but also, but also the other ones as well. Uh, we also have lost the demographic dividend. It was a major factor also 
behind the strong growth uh, through 2010, uh, as well as the, the geopolitical uncertainty. So you know, these factors are, are likely to be relatively permanent uh, over the next few years. So maybe we've turned a short term corner, but I don't think we're, we're likely to see a return to the sort of growth we were seeing earlier, uh, which is very concerning when you think about IAN's policy message that we need to really step up rates of investment. It's very hard to step up rates of investment uh, in a low growth world. Um, in terms of China, uh, China, I, I think there's a, you know, certainly a, a broad external consensus that I share that it, China's economic miracle has come to an, an end. I think the question is whether the end will be a, a disorderly one with a, with a possible uh, crisis emerging from the housing overinvestment in the housing market and the financial consequences of that, or a, a managed uh, soft landing. Um, I'm in the managed soft landing school because I think the Chinese government has a lot of policy tools and has been quite uh, successful in using those policy tools to, to avoid major threats to instability, uh, to, sorry, major threats to stability. Uh, but on the other hand, I, I really think they've reached the end of the road in terms of the drivers of the tremendous performance from uh, uh, 1980 to, to 2010. We've already seen a decade of, of slowing growth. I think that the slowdown will continue. And I think this you know, really reflects you know, a range of factors, uh, the housing, overinvestment in the housing market, uh, overinvestment by state enterprises and in infrastructure, transportation. Um, we've seen the you know, increasing fragility of the financial system, uh, which continues to be dominated by by public by public banks. So the the, the public sector is is uh, uh, not doing well, and the private sector, which was a, a very important driver of China's early success, has really increasingly been constrained uh, by uh, a, a sense that it's the entrepreneurship is, is not being encouraged, the, the playing field for access to financing is, is not level, that regulators are, are being cautious in ways that are you know, dampening animal spirits. There's a very strong political role in, in, in the private sector as well as the public sector. And un unless these factors are, are addressed, it's, it's hard to see China achieving the rates of growth of 5% plus that the, that the government wants uh, for a sustained period. So I suspect there'll be a, a, a gradual slowdown uh, of China of, over the next five or 10 years at best. Uh, and this has you know, quite important consequences for the EMDEs as, as pointed out by, by the Jeff, you know, slower Chinese growth feeds directly into slower growth uh, for China's suppliers, particularly of commodities. Um, and I think you know the, the, the advice I would give to a finance minister is you have to get accustomed to a world in which China is no longer the the, the massive tiger that it, that it was. Uh, that you need to get your own house in order. And here I would I would mention not not just the sort of sound monetary and fiscal policies, um, good investment environment, which is certainly very important. Uh, but also I, I think you know it, it's going to be very important to address the threats uh, to equality and, and inclusion. Uh, the, the growth uh, that was achieved uh, was very rapid. It raised many people out of poverty, but there remained very vast gulf between the people who's, who benefited and the people who did not. And that I think is an important factor behind the political strains that we're seeing in so many countries. Let me stop there. Thanks very much, Charles. And uh, that's, you gone forward which i think is great because you've also pointed out that while today we might be saying the last five years were the worst five years <laughs> since 1990s you look out to the end of the decade you might also end up saying the decade <laughs> as a whole even if there's some improvement uh, over the next five years <clears throat> i'm going to come to you in a minute uh, after uh, liliana to to come back on this point which is in some ways, I know you guys are not just looking next year, but you've done quite a lot of serious work on productivity and where it's growing on medium term growth rates. I think it'd be good to get a little bit your sense of if you were doing, admittedly, a little bit more speculative and 
not quite the same degree of precision uh, projections through to the end of the decade. How does that next five years look uh, for for this set of countries? But before I come to you, I, I want to come. To, I want to focus on two two regions in particular. Um, one of them is Latin America, which last year, Liliana, you remember we had the discussion and it was the slowest growing region and, and per capita incomes weren't doing well. Look this year, not much difference. Look next year, relative position, much the same. So I want to get a little bit your sense on, you know, are we stuck in a low growth equilibrium for Latin America? What's going on there that to try and help us understand a little bit. And then I want to say a little bit about Africa, also Sub-Saharan Africa in particular, uh, but I'll come to that in a minute. Liliana, over to you, please. Thank you so much, Masoud. Uh, first, uh, let me join uh, all of you in the panel to congratulate uh, Ehan and his team for a great report as always. Uh, Masoud, nothing is set in stone, but growth fundamentals really remain very weak in Latin America. So uh, growth prospects, in my view, are generally not very encouraging. You know, something that is very notorious is the sharp dichotomy between stability and growth in Latin America. The uh, World Bank report correctly identified that Latin America is one of the most successful regions in the management of inflation, of course, with the exception of Argentina and Venezuela. But at the same time, the report identifies the region as the one with the lowest growth rate. The reason for this split, in my view, is that the population at large and policymakers understand very well the damage of high inflation on their economies and so on the achievement of social progress. Uh, you know, history has been very clear on this front, right, in terms of the damage of inflation. So there is support and consensus for increases in interest rates to fight inflation in almost all the countries in the region. But the consensus ends there. With some exceptions, basically here and there, there are really not many exceptions, uh, policymakers and congresses have not been able to be on the same page to implement the needed structural reforms to support growth. So the way I see it is that there is kind of a vicious circle there's no reforms, so there is little economic growth and social progress. This, in turn, generates huge social discontent and feeds huge political divisions, which in turn have resulted in no consensus for reforms and therefore no growth. The problem is the dimension of this vicious circle, say kind of the, the circumference of the circle, has been expanding, and by now we have highly politically polarized countries. Now, you were talking about a decade of uh, potential um, uh, lackluster growth in emerging markets and in particular in Latin America. Well, in Latin America, these problems clearly started before the COVID-19 pandemic, I would say by about um, 2015, after the commodities uh, boom that brought high growth to the region for almost a decade. But since then, when this boom ended, when what we would call the external motors of growth sharply declined, growth ended too, because the internal motors of growth were not there. The pandemic basically intensified what were already existing problems, especially the, the what I would say the deterioration of the quality of governance and democratic institutions. This is a very important topic in Latin America. And also there were not the much needed reforms in labor markets. And so labor markets have been quite dysfunctional with amazingly high levels of labor and firms informality, which in some countries reach over 70% of total workers. You know, in the region, only Chile and Uruguay have labor data on labor for uh, informality below 30%. Well, we all know, and the GEP report has underlined this very many times, that informal sectors are much less productive than formal ones, creating, of course, a big obstacle to growth. The, we were talking about how long is the pandemic going to, the effects of the pandemic, the scars from the pandemic going to last. Well, 
the lockdowns during the pandemic have exacerbated the problems since the schools were closed for almost two years in some countries. And that has been affected education and the quality of human capital for the future. So basically, you have a, an enormous amount of problem, not only in the functioning of the labor markets, but also the kind of human capital that is going to be uh, um, feeding into that labor market in the future. So with all these, unfortunately, Masood, I really don't see resolution of these problems in the near future. Let me stop here for now. Okay, well, th thank you very much, uh, Liliana, for that. Um, Ehan, I want to come back to you, if I may, but can I just add one more uh, thought before you come in, which is on, on Sub-Saharan Africa. So that's the other region where if you look at the average growth rate, it's, uh, I think, short of 4%, 3 point something. Um, but it's also the region where population growth has been high and continues to be uh, high. Um, and so per capita numbers are very low, stagnant. I mean, you showed the numbers that, uh, that you were looking at. And I, when I look at the next few years prospects for Sub-Saharan Africa, of course, it's shouldn't generalize because Sub-Saharan Africa within it has some of the fastest growing countries in the world. But the big economies in the region, which between them, you know, we're talking South Africa, Nigeria, uh, Ethiopia. I mean, th these are the big economies that are driving Angola, that drive the aggregates. They have not been doing so well. And uh, that, of course, is a drag on some of the other economies in the, in the region as well. Then there's the debt issue, which particularly affects low-income countries. And, and uh, you know, recently, if you looked at the numbers, in many sub-Saharan African countries now, uh, they're paying 30, in some cases 40, 50% of, of their uh, revenues, uh, public sector revenues, going into doing debt service. Um, interest rates go up. That obviously affects the euro bonds that they've got, uh, which they're paying for. And uh, you did a nice uh, R and uh, interest rates and growth uh, and little equation or, or comparison. Of course, if anybody's borrowing at 8, 9, 10, 12% today, uh, it's going to be very hard to generate the growth rate to be able to exceed that in the medium term. So I wanted to get from you a little bit of a sense of the medium term prospects going out now to, let's say, through the next five years and get your sense in particular of where you see the pressure points, uh, particularly for emerging markets developing countries. Uh, th thank you. Thank you, Mr. Uh, so let me first talk about, you know, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, the good news is that <laughs> the maybe this is just the 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 the, uh, the nature of forecasting. Uh, we are expecting growth in the entire region actually to go up uh, from 2.9 percent last year to get to 3.8 percent this year and continue growing next year. Now, uh, last year we downgraded uh, the the the. I'm sorry, this year. For 2024, we downgraded growth forecasts uh, for 40% of countries in the region. The main reason is that they don't have the fiscal space and they need to keep monetary policy tight. And of course, these things weigh on growth. So there is this, you know, in the big uh, picture, there is growth. But uh, you mentioned these three largest economies, Nigeria, South Africa, and Angola. Uh, there's going to be uh, the the uh, the uh, pick up a little bit in those economies, uh, uh, but still the weakness in those economies uh, are going to pull the kind of the overall growth performance of the region um, that has been the case uh, for a while. With respect to per capita income, this is the kind of the second point I want to make. Uh, really, 1.2% this year per capita income growth is very weak, and I showed over the kind of the entire 2021-25 relative to advanced economies this is important relative to advanced economies per capita income growth in the region will average 
a negative number. So that means you are basically becoming poorer relative to advanced economies. We are hoping that you are going to become richer. You get close to the income levels of advanced economies. The third point, the, the debt issue uh, is, uh, is a big challenge. When you look at the countries uh, in, the, in the region, eight of them are in debt distress. Uh, countries like uh, Congo, Ghana, Malawi, uh, Somalia, Sudan, Zambia, Zimbabwe, well-known cases. Uh, but there are 12. They are uh, at a high risk of in falling into debt distress. And this uh, group uh, includes uh, countries uh, like Kenya, countries like Ethiopia. Um, these are not you know, small uh, economies. So, uh, and the big issue is that the government debt will remain around 60% relative to GDP. And uh, the spending uh, on debt service will be above uh, 11% uh, relative to government revenue. So government, uh, re uh, governments need to allocate a significant chunk of the revenues for just debt service. So uh, in the case of Africa, we are concerned. A number of African economies are members of IDA. Uh, I mentioned the kind of the uh, dire state of IDA income convergence already. Now, the looking forward, why we raise this issue of weakest half decade growth performance? Because we are worried that 2020s will be a lost decade for developing world. When I think about this growth performance going forward. Uh, there are two ways to think about this issue. Uh, Mesut, you know these things uh, more than anyone else. The first is the arithmetic. At the end of the day, you need engines of growth. Some countries should deliver high growth. China was the flag carrier for the developing economies, emerging markets. But it is slowing. It has to slow. It has to get a meaningful, healthy growth rate and a sustained growth rate. Who's going to replace China? It's going to be very difficult to replace China. India has been the rising star. Hopefully, India will contribute a lot, already contributing. But you need many more countries to step up and deliver higher growth. Which countries are those? We need to see. Uh, the, the second thing we need to think about you know, what are the underlying structural drivers of growth? And there we have important challenges. I already mentioned the challenge associated with the global trade growth, uh, uh, the, the, the basically the trade growth much weaker than what we saw historically in, the, in this millennium. And then the, you think about the financing conditions, uh, uh, the financing conditions will remain tight, debt remains will, uh, uh, debt levels remain elevated. There is so much promise in many emerging developing economies. The big question for the global community, whether the global community has the will to realize that promise with, you know, intelligent, uh, uh, close uh, cross country collaboration uh, interventions. And of course, at the national level, developing country policymakers right. need to think about what they can do. Back to you, Mesut. Thank, thank you very much, Ihan. No, I think that that's absolutely right. The, the points that you've raised. I want to. We were ten minutes left, and I want to come back to two specific uh, issues with our panelists. For Charles, I wanted to get your take a little bit on the politics, and politics at two levels. One, there's a whole series of elections coming up this year. Half the world is going to be going through uh, an election this year. And in a number of countries, uh, there's a worry that the election might result in governments that are more inward looking, uh, not as committed to multilateralism. And oh, that's obviously a, a real worry, but how much should uh, emerging market developing country policymakers worry about it? What impact will it actually have in, on growth prospects? And, and the, the other one is sort of, politics at the geopolitical level, because in the same way, there's a concern about nearshoring, friendshoring, trade routes being reconfigured, not basing on economic uh, uh, competitiveness, but on security or, or political uh, factors. Again, 
I'm sure some of that is happening and will continue to happen, but how much should uh, emerging market and developing country policymakers worry about the, the consequence of that uh, on, on, on their economies? I think they should be very worried. Um, I am myself very worried. Um, I mean, the elephant in the room, of course, is what happens in the US in, in November. Um, and if we get a, a return of President Trump, I think we're going to see a, re a return of the policies that he espoused when he was president, in, including increasing protectionism, uh, a withdrawal from multilateral multilateral cooperation uh, in you know, a, a, you know, across the board, in, including perhaps most importantly on on climate. Uh, but also on, on, on tax cooperation, on trade cooperation, on international financial cooperation. Um, I think those are certainly sort of direct first order worries. But the, but the, the, the bigger concern I, I would have is, is more of a geopolitical concern about the signal it might send to countries uh, that might be tempted to continue to follow ag aggressive paths uh, against, against others. Uh, I mean, Russia, I think most obviously would be encouraged to su sustain, maybe even redouble its, its assault on, on Ukraine and maybe maybe elsewhere, increasing concerns about the situation in, in Middle East and the potential for spreading conflict there. And perhaps the, the, the biggest, you know, the, the, black, the black swan here is, is, is what could happen in, in East Asia. Um, I think that's you know, rel relatively low likelihood uh, but on the other hand, very, very large impact if, if that were to occur. Um, so I, I think Paul, the you know, leaders in the, in the emerging market should be following very closely what's happening in, in the U.S. and, and be prepared uh, for, for for negative events there. Uh, otherwise, I, I think we'll, we'll probably see a sort of fairly mixed bag. The recent elections have sometimes been been quite favourable. Uh, for example, I think in, in Poland we we now have a return to a, a reformist government. That's that's encouraging. Um, but we need to see what happens in in Argentina. And we need to see what happens in Mexico. Uh, I think in India it's pretty much a foregone conclusion. But these these are relatively right. small compared to the potential impact of uh, political change in the U.S. No, thank you very much, Charles. No, I, I think it's important to just be clear about that. Yeah. And and we've got Hanan online as well. It's really happy to have you, Hanan, in the closing minutes. And I will come <coughs> to you in a minute. Uh, but uh, maybe if you don't mind, uh, Liliana, I was going to come to you next. But since Hanan has just joined, and we've only got seven minutes uh, left, I wanted to come to, to Hanan, if I may. And we were talking about uh, the issue of Africa. I, I'm not sure whether you heard Ehan and I were having a conversation a bit about Africa. I want to get your take a bit on where do you see the opportunities uh, which could help to turn the relatively uh, somber perspectives that, that we've been talking about for sub-Saharan Africa. Where, where do we think that there are opportunities that we're not talking about enough, that we're not aware of, maybe that are not being exploited enough? Any thoughts on the on the opportunities? Sure. Um, apologies for uh, being late and joining you, and um, great to see you all. Uh, let me perhaps just comment on something that when I joined, I just heard was you know among the discussions you were having which i think something that concerns me and on its impact on africa which is rising geopolitical risks that you know um we see um, implications of deep uh, fragmentation and heightened uh, competition among you know uh, uh, major economies and trends of less cooperation and all it's leading to to also some, um, you know, whether it's technological decoupling, whether it's, uh, 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 you know, uh, relationship and competition, um, you know, kind of, you know, uh, between how countries should 
form their collaboration with each side. So many emerging countries, and particularly Africa, are in between. And this is affecting uh, many things, uh, whether it's from investment side, trade, or uh, even uh, um, you know, resolution on finance issues. Uh, uh, we've seen also this affecting um, you know, the issues of this like deep fragmentation. Uh, we've seen it uh, manifest in global pattern trades that have a geopolitical nature, depending on you know, those that you know, have a similar UN vote, uh, seem to have been relations have been, in, you know, or trade have been, volumes have been increasing over the last uh, uh, you know, couple of years. So this has serious implications um, for Africa and developing countries, but uh, I think turning from that to what opportunities does it offer? And from an African perspective, it offers opportunities in terms of getting into, you know, the, the issues of supply chain uh, disruptions, moving the focus from uh, basically being driven by low cost and efficiency to more being driven by proximity and trust. Uh, so there will be, um, you know, opportunities to get and break into global value chains that would not have been possible before because the criteria for which these were formed were different. Now we're seeing, you know, the near shoring and with the uh, African regional integration, this offers also another huge opportunity. So focusing on, you know, the regional integration and trading among African nations which we've seen progress in, but also getting into globally supply chains that have been, you know, dominated before by, you know, uh, in China. Now they're looking into diversifying that and, you know, proximity to many of these economies is a plus. So I see the opportunity and issues of like, you know, access to supply chain connections that were not possible before, uh, tapping into the potential of uh, you know, African regional integration, and third, actually, uh, the opportunity opportunities for investing in um, you know renewable energy potential for Africa, and also into uh, basically you know, uh, building value chains around uh, green uh, industries, given the all the natural resources in Africa. So I think these are really some of the key opportunities that perhaps the the all the um, you know global trends and developments will lead to more like focusing on things that can be game changers for the continent thank you very much and thank you also I appreciate the fact that you could join us and, and share those important thoughts uh just before we go liliana i'm going to put you on the spot with uh, like a one minute answer on We've been talking about debt issues in low-income countries, but you know, I know we've talked that we're also quite worried about rising pressures on corporates in emerging markets in terms of debt that they have taken on, uh, impact of higher interest rates on debt in emerging markets. How much should we be worrying about a financial crisis as a risk in in? particularly in Latin America, which historically has had financial crises as in many countries. Uh, quick reactions to that. Yes, thank you, Masood. Um, well, that you're right on that. Latin America is known as the banking crisis prone region, especially in the early 2000s. Uh, there are some stresses in the financial markets, but you know, I really don't expect any major or generalized crisis. To, very quickly, two reasons. The, uh, you know, there is a huge consensus, uh, again, not only for being against uh, inflation because of the experience of hyperinflation, but there is also a consensus mm -hmm. about not having huge financial crisis because that destroyed the economies of Latin America significantly. So basically that consensus have helped to have to build independence on the institutions such as the superintendencies in the region. Uh, there was also at the beginning of last year, remember the collapse of Silicon Valley Bank, and there was consensus, uh, concerns as to whether something like that could happen in Latin America. Why? Because banking systems in Latin America uh, hold 
large proportions of government debt. But the truth of the matter is that no, uh, uh, supervisors came very quickly to check their banking systems. They did a lot of stress tests. Brazil is notor notorious about this because Brazilian banking system holds huge amount of government paper, but they did their job and they have been doing well. You know what the real financial crisis is in Latin America? Is more in terms of disintermediation. What happened is that this, the banking system has been adjusting to the insufficiency of good projects associated with lot investment and growth. And so they have been reducing the growth of credit significantly. So in Latin America, the problem, rather than lack of liquidity, which usually brings a crisis, there is too much liquidity. The ratio of liquid assets relative to loans is incredibly high. This means that financial intermediation, which is, of course, the transformation of deposits into loans, has decreased, decreased significantly. So rather than a crisis of financial stability, the sharp reduction in, in the bank inter intermediation could be the real financial crisis in the region. Yeah, thank you very much, Liliana. We should have a separate session on whether it's more damaging that banks don't lend because they don't see good projects or there are other examples of countries where banks lend for bad projects because those are the only ones around and then you end up with asset problems in their portfolios down the road and we've just been talking about real estate over investment in, in China with a lot of banking uh, behind it. Uh, so the, we should have a conversation on, on which of the two is likely to be more more damaging in the long run. Ehan, I want to thank you for, and your team for having done this. And I obviously want to thank Charles and Hanan and, and Liliana and all the colleagues who put this together. But before we close, any final thoughts from you? The, I think the final thought, uh, Mesut here, uh, there is always this discussion about optimism and pessimism when we think about the global economy. Uh, it is important to basically look at the short-term prospects, but put them in you know historical context and put them in global context, and have a realistic perspective. And that perspective, uh, in light of these geopolitical tensions, coming elections, the you know the politics, the rise of populism, even more important. And I think people on the street would like to have that realistic perspective. Uh, and if we can continue having this type of dialogue and provide that perspective, that's all the better for all of us. Uh, and thank you again for giving us this opportunity to work with you uh, to, to uh, explain our views. Back to you. Thank you very much, Ehan. And uh, as I say, this has really become a tradition for CGD. This is, uh, I believe, the sixth year, I think, that we're doing this. And I very much hope that uh, this is a tradition that will continue in the years ahead. So uh, uh, looking forward to seeing you, uh, watching you a year's time again, making the same presentation. Thanks everyone for joining. Thank you. Thank you.